Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Pierce. I'm president of Florida Cattlemen Association. I've got my partner with me today. Good morning. My name is Jim Hanley. I work for the Florida Cattlemen's Association. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to have a conversation with you this morning and just basically walk you through some of the, the various things that we as an organization have been working on. Uh, Matt's going to give you just a brief, brief background on his history and where he come from and how long his folks been in the cow business, and then I'll I'll do a bit of the same. Yep. Um, as Jim said, um, I'm serving as president of the Cattlemen Association this year. Uh, I'm seventh generation uh, Florida cattleman, and I'm raising the eighth generation. My kids, um, they interviewed me, and and uh, I, I don't know if I got it wrong or or if uh, the person who wrote the articles wrote it wrong, but it's anywhere from fifth to seventh generation in all the publications. My wife gets on me, but I'll set it straight today. It's seven generations got the family tree written out where we can see it. But um, a lot, a lot like some of y'all, you know, multiple generations. Uh, we ranch in uh, Cluiston on some lease properties and WRP. We got land on the northwest shore, Lake Okeechobee, where I was raised on the Kissimmee River, and then uh, lease pasture scattered out and then up into Perry, Georgia. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to come here today to to own and speak to everyone, and and I hope we have to interact and and uh, have a good response today. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Matt's one of our six officers, and he's been uh, on this stair step up to becoming the president for the last six years. Uh, <clears throat> as for myself, I'm a fifth generation Floridian. I'm from over on the ridge in Highlands County, uh, in Sebring. It's where I was born and raised, and uh, at the present time, my kids and grandkids have more cows than I have, but I like to brag that basically we think uh, probably that the Florida Cattlemen's Association represents probably 92 to 94 percent of the cow herd in the state of Florida. A little history about the organization. It was founded in 1934 by a group of, of 10 or 11 ranchers uh, in the Kissimmee area. There was a real strong University of Florida Extension person that helped them do a lot of the administrative work. And they came together as a group to work on a lot of the same topics that we continue to work on. Certainly flood control, certainly research, certainly uh, pest and disease, private property rights. And we continue to work on all those things. And those are involved in a lot of the research work that you all are continuing to do, mineral supplementation, and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> why don't you give them a little bit more of an overview of the organization? Okay. Um, uh, like Jim said, uh, I'm, I'm serving as president this year, but when we start out, we uh, have a nominating committee and we elect our secretary and they move up to treasurer into a uh, first vice president or second vice president, first vice president, president elect, and then your ultimately your sentence ends with being president for a seven year term. Um, so our, our association, like Jim said, was founded in 1934 at, at the convention. I spoke about uh, one of the founders, which was my great grandfather, John Olin Pierce. He was one of the, I think, nine guys or 10 guys that went to Tallahassee and lobbied for flood control, disease prevention, and then private property rights. Same thing, Dennis, that we, we fight for today. Uh, we're a grassroots organization of close to 5,000 members or um, give or take a couple. And uh, we're, we, we work for y'all. Uh, when, when we go to water management meetings or county commission meetings or to uh, lobbying in Tallahassee or Washington, D.C., we're working for the folks in the industry. So um, we, we couldn't do it without our membership and, and uh, the committee-based structure that we have. Um, let me think about the convention that we just had in June. Uh, we had a record crowd of 2,000 folks, a little over 2,000 people in Marco Island. And like I say, it's a grassroots organization. So if, if we're not having people show up at the convention, we're, we're not getting work done. But but we are uh, very aggressive on, on what we're doing on the committee level. Um, that is an increase over last year. And, and we do have a, a large participation in our membership. Um, some of the things uh, coming out of the convention, uh, we we hired uh, Benita Whalen, which is an engineer um, out of the Palm Beach area. She's our water and environmental manager. And you know what, what does that mean to folks um, around the state? Well, uh, Benita's job is to focus on water and environment. 
And in today's climate, that's the probably the greatest single challenge uh, other than the market uh, to, a, to a rancher is the environment and water because we're getting pressure every day from outside, whether it be housing or water management or, or regulatory agencies. So, so just to kind of speak about uh, what Benita's doing and the association, what, what we're doing and, and our, our vision for, for the next few years is um, we've hosted some water management tours and uh, we've actually used some IFAS information and, and some information from research from uh, in, in entities like Buck Island Ranch, uh, where we've hosted uh, the board members from the South Florida Water Management, because that's kind of where we're getting the, the most activity, uh, I wouldn't say pressure, but the most activity from, from a region. And, and it's eye-opening for, for those members uh, who become friends of ours, and they're all new. They're, these are all new board members on, on water management. But to show them a ranch. And so what we see every day of the wildlife and the cattle and the environment and the water, um, when, when they see it, you know, they're coming from more of a, a, an asphalt and, and, coast. and, and the coast, uh, they're amazed. And, and that's just, uh, you know, it, it makes me feel good because I take it for granted that when we get out in the woods or what, what y'all do every day, you see this kind of stuff. You see bald eagles, you see deer, you see gopher turtles, all the endangered species. And, and you know, we take it for granted that most, most people don't get to see that. So when they see it, it's eye-opening, but we've had uh, several, I think three, three board members take individual ranch tours. And then we've had some congressional delegation come and take these same ranch tours. And, and that's our focus in, in the industry. And we've budgeted so much time per week to take out of my schedule as a volunteer leader and Jim's schedule on, on staff. And then as, as Benita, to, to focus on the water and the environmental issues that, that we're faced with, because it's a perception in today. Um, I, I'll take you back to last Thursday. Uh, we, we'll talk about the issues management workshop here in a minute, but I went to the water management meeting in, in Palm Beach and took Benita with me and another couple other ranchers. And, and when we're sitting in the crowd, the perception is that we're scattering fertilizer all up and down the Kissimmee River. And you know that, and then we look at the BMPs, and they're not working, and and it's just that folks aren't aren't up to speed on what we're doing as, as ranchers or environmentalists on the land. So our job is to change that perception. So we tell the stories. I, I let folks like Hillary Swain from Buck Island talk about the scientific part. I let Benita talk about the scientific part because I'm not a scientist. I'm just a rancher. You know, so I talk from emotion and what what i do every day and what i see so i spoke about being born on the kissimmee river and and my family grazing cattle from uh fort Bassinger along the western side of the kissimmee river all the way to the lake shore where there wasn't the herbert hoover dike around the lake and where they didn't have to burn the vegetation and stuff and, and control it with chemicals they controlled it with cattle so that's, that's what i spoke about and the the legacy phosphorus and, and different uh specific things and, and they, they thank us uh, for coming, but, but it's the perception um, of, of what we do. So we have to change that perception. So I challenge you while you're out talking to folks or, or get the opportunity to, to share your story on social media, um, we, we share that, that positive message. Um, and it's more about cattle, Jim, or I mean, it's more about uh, the environment and water and wildlife than it is about cattle anymore. Uh, we're, we're protecting a, a vast, uh, resource. And, and we're trying to overcome the public perception and mis, misunderstanding and, and just educate them. We've come a long ways as, as an industry and with the fine work that, that, that that's done here at ONA and all over the state and with the various organizations that we work with from, from the standpoint of advancing the science of ranching and taking care of the land, we've only gotten better. We've only gotten gotten more precision in how we feed plants and how we convert roughage into pounds of beef and ship phosphorus out of here in semi loads of feeder cattle going west. But we can't take for granted that the people that are coming a thousand a day to the state of Florida don't really realize that this exists. Sure, they may pass through and they see a few cattle grazing, but they really don't know. And we're trying to encourage more people to swing the gate open. We have nothing to hide. If everybody here looks after a, a pretty unique 
piece of God's creation and do a darn good job of it. And many of you have been doing it for many, many generations. But we, if we're guilty of anything, it's not sharing our story, sharing our heritage, and helping them understand the science. So we've got a big task at hand. We are, as an industry, generally pretty conservative, generally pretty humble. We don't wave the flag and blow our own horn, and we've just got a job to do to help them understand that. And of course, some of the, the, the water events and some of the blue-green algae and some of the red tide issues that they've experienced because they had to turn the water out of the big lake, um, it's natural for them to say, well, those guys up there fertilizing and spraying 24 hours a day and seven days a week are probably the, the, the cause of some of these nutrients in the water. We're trying to help them understand everybody has an effect on the environment and that we think we're part of the solution using cattle and using science and implementing BMPs. So a big part of our effort with this, with this particular initiative of, of th that the executive committee and Matt has brought forward is certainly get more proactive at being engaged and helping those people understand. And when he mentioned the ranch tours, there's not been a single rancher or member that, that we've said, hey, we wanna come tour your place, show what you're doing, explain what you're doing, to some of, these, some, some of these people that are public servants, some are elected, some are appointed, but they really don't have a background in our world. And, and shame on us for to assume that they do, but we're certainly trying to make that case and help them understand it. And again, base it all on science that some of you sitting here are involved in, 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 in helping uh, create through your research and the, and the work that we do. We think we have an outstanding uh, a collaborative relationship with, with the University of Florida, IFAS, all segments of it, um, as well as the Florida Department of Ag and Office of Ag Water Policy. Um, um, the implementation of BMPs, a lot of folks have interpreted that it's 100% voluntary, and that's really not the case. I've, I've been a, a bit surprised at how many people felt like that, that, uh, that, that very few people were implementing BMPs but they make economic sense. And so once people become familiar with them, they are implementing them. And the alternative, if you're in a BMAP, uh, uh, where there's a basin, basin management action plan that, that DEP has to come up with, with water management districts, if, you're, if your property's in that area, you have two options. Implement, sign the notice of intent, work with the FDAC, uh, Office of Ag Water Policy technical folks, and implement best management practices. A lot of them are based on um, practical, common sense things, but we have to do a better job of recording what we're doing, writing it down, and verifying what we're doing. And in some cases, where there are some cost share programs that we can take advantage of. The alternative to implementing the BMPs is water quality uh, monitoring. And that's quite expensive and extensive and would, is, would, I dare say it would be a, a pretty big undertaking for a lot of our private land managers. Most of our property, the cattle are on, most of the property is private held. And you folks are paying taxes on it and, and managing it for the next generation. I like to, to, to promote the idea that we can harvest nutrients with cattle, like Matt described, down to the, the cattle will follow the water line. They'll keep that vegetation and understory under control but they keep it in a vegetative state so that it's pulling nutrients out of the water and pulling nutrients out of the soil. And certainly, so I promote that we can help them manage public land with a cow, a cow or a match. Of course, with, 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 it's harder and harder to burn as much as, as, as our population has grown, as many highways as there are and potential uh, liability issues. So the, the next best thing is cow. They're starting to understand that with goats and different ruminants in the west where they have an extensive wildfires but in our case where we have such a long growing season and what are we getting 55 60 inches of rain virtually had no winter there's a lot of grazing that a cow can convert to two pounds and can pull a lot of nutrients we've got to help them understand that we provide a lot of environmental services with a ranch water filtration water recharge air wildlife, unique habitat, public gets that free. Uh, they're, 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 there's no fee for that. And that's done all over the state with cattle. And 
the way we ranch is a little different as you move from South Florida to North Florida, but it's still the same. It's ruminant animals taking advantage of a lot of forage and with the right amount of minimal supplementation, minimal uh, fertilization. Um, um, it, it, you know, it, it, it can keep the state and the water clean if they'll just allow us to and not move to the to 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 asphalt and concrete everywhere. And we try to illustrate which is better, uh, asphalt and concrete or um, ranching and open open country. But if they so we try to implore to the to the elected officials if they go a regulatory route and it puts economic burden and pressure on the enterprise, then it's a lot easier to shake your head yes when a development comes in or something or a more intensive land use because you're under economic pressure. And so you have to go to a, a crop that offers potential stronger economic return on a per acre on a per acre basis. Some of them are starting to understand that. There's always turnover with our elected officials. There's turnover with our water manager, with our appointed members of all these boards. So you constantly, constantly are having to educate them and help them understand, understand that. Um, in Tallahassee, uh, we work on a wide variety of things, but primarily we, we want adequate funding for uh, the University of Florida land grant mission in IFAS. We want adequate funding for the Department of Ag so that they can implement the programs to protect their industry. We talk about the Division of Animal Industry. We talk about the Office of Ag Water Policy. Certainly those things are very, very important and we continue to advocate for them so that, so that they can continue to operate and service our industry. We are comprised of some 55 county organizations. What Matt and the other officers, and he's got a 15 person executive committee but they report to a board that has representation from every county organization. Each county in good standing with our association has the opportunity to send a board, board representative. And then in, they, they establish the priorities that they want us, the staff, to work on um, through their committee work. And there's a variety of committees. There's certainly marketing, environmental, research, animal health, we have a wonderful youth program. I, 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 and, and, and all of our committees are driven by volunteer producers. And all of our committees are open to any citizen really that wants to come. You don't have to have a special invitation and we don't check your name at the door. We need input and we need involvement. And if there's anything I, I, I'd, I'd like to just ask you to please come and get engaged in the process to provide your input. But that flows from our county organizations. We as a state association are a longtime affiliate member organization of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. They have an office in Denver and they have an office in Washington, DC. They are a, a <clears throat> contractor and, and they get research projects and things funded through the Cattlemen's Beef Board that's funded by the Beef Checkoff, along with six or eight or 10 other contractors, but on their membership or policy side of their organization, they work and, and have a strong team of lobbyists in, in Washington working on issues of concern for our industry. Matt, why don't you share some of those particular, uh, there's five or six major priorities that they're focused on right now. Yeah, Jim. So as Jim talked about the NCBA, um, what, you know, a lot of what they're doing is is the stuff that we can't go to Washington D.C. and do ourselves. Um, same way with our state association, we're doing a lot of things in Tallahassee that that you can't go to Tallahassee and do yourself. So, just some of the top line things that the NCBA group's doing is uh, fake meat. If y'all have heard of fake meat, and uh, what what I, I I'm I'm very strongly opposed to fake meat. So, if you know the back side of the story of, of how they create it and the the wash water it takes and, and the sulfates that it takes to make this, it, it's actually uh, more harmful the for the environment than uh, raising beef. And, and that's the, the story that's being told by the negative press is that, well, we're, we're converting from, you know, uh, protein based on, on cattle 
or uh, other proteins because it's so bad for the environment um, to uh, to a fake meat or a lab grown product, which they're not telling you is is more a detriment is processed. It's more detrimental to the environment on some of the secondary things that they do. What what I get a kick out of is when you watch the morning uh, talk shows and and they're giving you the demonstration of the fake meat versus the beef and and you know when when they eat the beef they they have a a, a joyous a look on their face and then when they eat fake meat you know they, they don't want to show but they do end up showing it because their emotions are it's not good um, from a taste standpoint um, so so the consumer will will ultimately dictate that but what we want and what NCDA is fighting for is um, just oversight so if if you're going to provide a product that's new to the market um, we're, we're, NCBA and, and cattlemen want uh, USDA and FDA oversight of the production of this product, no different than, you know, animals coming out of the processing plant, they get graded and inspected for food safety and properly, um, labeled. And, and properly labeled. So, so, uh, you know, the main thing is that is protecting the consumer, because if we have some, some issues, because this stuff is, is fairly new and, and all the research isn't in on it, but um, that that's where we're at on, on that. And you'll see more of that in the news and, and just, you know, I challenge you to educate yourself on it. Um, trade is a big issue. I think the last numbers I heard, and Chris is in here, he can correct me. I, I, I don't mind being wrong, but we're, we're at about 320 something, $325 ahead on a finished product value back from export, correct? Um, so so you think about that, if you're a cow-calf producer in the state of Florida, you know what, what does that mean to you? Um, well, that means that they're going to net that back down to a 550 or 550 pound calf, and, and they're going to pull uh, probably 20 cent out of the market on that. If if we if we were to lose all of our exports, and, and I don't think we will, but but that could happen. So so trade is a big deal um, on what we do. I think 12 percent of our product is, is trade. Is that right? Um, so I'm getting all my numbers right because all the all the all the experts are shaking their heads. So so um, anyway. Uh, so, so we've got the USMCA, which is the Canada-Mexico uh, agreement. And, and that's big because what when I travel the countryside, people are saying, well, why do we want to take Mexican cattle in? Well, I can tell you that pretty easy is because we want to send more product south. And why is that? Well, because when we go to eat, we eat hamburger and steak, right, Joe? Um, but, well, the, there are different cultures, and there's a lot of cultures represented in this room, eat different, you know, they have a different taste for different proteins and and where we're marketing is is the products that we don't want domestically um but but then somebody else sees but a value in we sell at a discount yeah. we can sell at a premium to some of the country right. especially organ meat and yeah short ribs and things yeah. such as that so that's you know fair trade back and forth and that's what you want you don't want it to be lopsided so so in ncba is working hard uh with with the the administration to, to trade. Japan's a big deal uh, because there's a lot of competitors that trade into Japan, like New Zealand and Australia, uh, China and, and um, Canada and South America. Um, but but I read some statistics the other day that um, if, uh, if if we lost the Japanese trade, you know, through 2028, I think it's a billion dollars in, uh, in sales. So, I mean, my point is that that um, if, if you follow my stuff on Facebook or you follow NCBA's, uh, trade's a big issue. They were in, uh, Jim and I got back from uh, Denver at the summer conference on the Thursday and Friday, the rest of the crew, the leadership from NCBA was at Washington DC with the president and, uh, and our trade uh, staff and, and the European Union. And so that, that increased the quota and opened up more trade with European Union uh, on hormone-free beef, uh, which would be, you know, natural or, or non-implanted, which, you know, opens up from a production standpoint, you know, how you want to manage your own operation if you want to track those markets. But it does open up a different market force. Um, and, and then China, you know, so, so, so we need to keep adding value to that, uh, to that finished product. And, um, and, and that, that helps us back on this 550-pound ranch calf. Um, so the trade trade's a big issue. Um, I think we've missed the boat on some trades, but but we we've gotten uh, the win on some other ones. And, and and from a Florida standpoint, when when Jim and I and our staff and our leaders, when we go to D.C. 
for international trade, we always try to protect the other Florida commodity groups, you know, whether it be tomatoes, watermelons, uh, citrus, you know, I mean, yeah, we, as an example, we support the, the US, Canada, Mexico agreement, but we certainly would like for them to find a solution to uh, the pressure they're putting on to our, our friends that are growing fruit and vegetables where they're important uh, products so cheaply and killing our market for our, our friends. From a beef standpoint, the trade agreement's outstanding. They have a fix that the entire Florida delegation is trying to make a part of the agreement to protect our winter vegetable growers or tomato guys and, and stuff if they will just put that in place. It's not in place, but we certainly stand together with them and support what they are pursuing to, to, to save what they're doing uh, as far as growing, growing fresh vegetables and, and fruit here in the state of Florida. You might mention the dietary guidelines and the ELD. Yeah, the the dietary guidelines. You know, we're always at pressure when when the USD, USDA when or an FDA working together when, to establish uh, dietary guidelines for the whole country. Right, and so you get other uh, entities that are involved in that policy, and and you know, and I, I remember a couple of years ago they were wanting to reduce the the amount of beef or or protein, um, you know, specifically beef that that was it in the diet, you know, and, and especially, you know, some of this is in the school lunch programs and you got to think about it. Um, a, a lot of kids that go to school, that that's the best meal of the day. And you know, we don't think about it uh, where we come from and how we were raised on, on the farmer ranch, but a lot of the uh, inner city folks don't, you know, they don't have the financial or they don't, you know, they're in, in these food deficit areas, but, but we always have to challenge that dietary guideline from our standpoint, um, that they're doing it correctly and, and not. You know. Yeah, we want it to all be based on nutritional science and dietary science, not somebody with another agenda who puts pressure there and is suggesting that we need to change the diet of the consuming Americans because it will help the environment. The dietary guidelines are to feed people and provide proper nutrition. So we need nutrition science at mm -hmm. the table. And unfortunately, they're they're at times they've gotten kind of off track because they were pursuing, they were feeling getting pressure from other angles that 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 were you know an attempt to reduce consumption of meat and meat production. But as long as it's based on science and it's done to improve the diet of the consuming public, we we in favor of it and embrace that science aggressively. So between the USDA and the Health and Human Services, um, we, we applaud where they are now and they're on the right track in, in, in developing the, the dietary guidelines. Yeah, the ELD is the electronic logging device. Uh, so when, when you all ship cattle and you put them on the truck, you're bound to wait and then you're bound to a time that driver can actually keep that truck on the road. So we've had some challenges with that because to go back to the very basics of this, when policy or legislation is made, you know, somebody out of the crowd is trying to get, you know, their bill to get reelected. So they come up with some fancy uh, policy that sounds good on, on, you know, a, a short basis. Um, but then when you analyze it from the whole industry or the whole perspective, you, you find holes in it. So, I mean, I'm all for, uh, the FedEx trucks or, you know, some sort of transportation on a, a running distances that you can log from A to B where you put a box of, of C in something and, and, it, and it ends up where it's going. But, but when you're dealing with livestock or bees or, you know, other agricultural product, products, you have to get them on at point A and get them off at point B safe and, and humane. And, and what we're running up against is the, the timeline and, and it doesn't affect the folks as much in the interior, say, from the Mississippi River back to the feeding states as it does the folks in, in South Florida right here, where it takes us 10, 12 hours just to get out of the state. And then we haven't passed the first feed yard or, or a place that the cattle are going. You know, some, some cattle are staying here in the state getting fed, but a small percentage. But our destination is, is putting us out of that um, hours of service area. And so, so we're, we're, we're struggling and, and trying to fight for that. And we've kind of pushed that 
deadline back by, by the years and and looking at a livestock exemption and we've had some some uh, legislators that have been favorable to that that have a tie to the agriculture industry and we can get to them and show them that it's about animal welfare when you put that animal on the truck then you want them to get to wherever they're going in kansas or texas or whatever as safe as they can and then we we've shown the numbers of instances on um, you know accidents and stuff and and it's less than the industry average way less and then it's usually you know a reaction of that truck from somebody else's mistake you know it's not that driver that went out and, and, and had a mishap it's somebody that that did it uh, to them so that being said we're working on that the, all of these issues whether it's ncba or fca it, the lobbying effort is uh is tremendous that that we do as voluntary uh, uh leaders you know and we're, we're constantly like jim says we're we're advocating for IFAS and for 4-H and, and the University of Florida and, and the other land grants and institutions and, and to keep this research going that, that's beneficial to what we do every day. But there's there's some other stuff, uh, Jim, the, the WOTUS, the, the Waters of the U.S., of the US. Um, which, you know, if, if anybody that's pr pr um, promoted that policy comes to South Florida right now, they might as well just take all of our land. You know, because we're we're at six yeah. And what we're talking about is is the is, is, is the Clean Water Act and, and and updating that rule. And there was some potential uh, some time back that they were going to give much broader jurisdiction to the to the EPA than we think is necessary. And they were going to modify the definition of navigable waters. And what Matt's saying is, well, you can navigate across a lot of these pastures at this present time and it was it's all about the interpretation of just how far their reach would have gotten well under this administration we've made a lot of inroads and put some more common sense in it and and we believe that needs to be controlled at the state level as opposed to the feds trying to control it nationwide and uh and and we have buy-in and agreement from the the dep and certainly all of the municipalities uh, it's a, it, the waters of the U.S. would affect basically everything. And when you have a flat place, a uh, country like Florida with so much water, they would have jurisdiction over the majority of it, both public and private land. And so um, that is being clarified and we have a much more friendly rule than what we could have had, but we have to keep our hand on the pulse to make sure that it doesn't impose on your private property rights and how you manage your property and your water um, right here at home. That's a, that's a real big issue, certainly as it affects the state of Florida. To just go a little further into Matt's description on the electronic logging device, that, that's a result of the, of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Act and where they want to log drivers and they want to reduce tired, sleepy drivers with big trucks on the road. We understand that, but it doesn't really fit when you're moving, less we call them insects, honeybees, pollinators, and you're moving live fish and you're moving live cattle. The stress on them, uh, you gotta get them there and get them there as quickly as possible. I think the mishaps are, are few in number because our drivers are conscientious and they know they've got a live cargo on there and it's shrinking and it might be stressing and it might cost them some money if they get there and they've thrown them down and been reckless and, and caused harm to them. And to unload them and reload them and restage them, that's really not an alternative because you have a shrinking commodity. And 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 the researchers will, will tell you, and certainly there's been a lot of work done on, on understanding shrink, but as quick as they get on that truck, they uh, are, are, are gonna start losing weight and potentially having health stress. So you need to get blow the wind on them and get them there as rapidly as possible. We've opened some eyes and helped people understand that that, 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 that we hope we will continue to find some flexibility and understanding by the government to allow us to move insects and livestock uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a humane manner that is best for the livestock and get those bees to pollinate. You know, a lot of people, let's say Florida, our, our bees leave here and go to California uh, to, to and, and are used out there to pollinate those crops. And, it's not an, the alternative of stopping them, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, anyway, we're working in unison as we do 
on most every issue in unison with other segments of the industry. We do that both at the state and the federal level. We collaborate with all the other commodity organizations um, because we are a, a, a minority from the standpoint of people understanding production agriculture and how we're going to feed a growing world population. So we have to work hand in hand with them, but do everything we do based on, on science and sound logical thinking and not an emotional overreaction. Yeah, so so that's kind of the NCBA part of it. And and like Jim said, we're we're affiliates under NCBA. And, and if you're not a member of NCBA, I'd encourage you to join. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, with the European Union and then some of the work with the Endangered Species Act, which was yesterday, um, I mean, uh, I, I'll brag on our NCBA folks because Region 2 covers the Southeast, and that's, that's who represents us. And the president this year is Jennifer Houston. She's from Tennessee. And then the president-elect is one of our own, a past president, uh, Marty Smith from Ocala. So, so the next two, or the, or the current and next leader of the NCBA are, are from our region. And, and it, I said something yesterday. It seems like they've been at the White House every week since we've seen them three weeks ago or so. So, so they're they're on our on, on our payroll and, and working for us. So that's that's very positive. Um, you want to go over some events? We we kind of yeah, a lot of things. We do a lot of things as a statewide organization beyond just lobbying for policy. Um, I mentioned earlier, and Matt mentioned that we had an outstanding annual convention at which time we elected our new officers and our, 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 our new leadership. Matt has the opportunity to appoint his committee chair, chair and vice chair of all the policy committees. He's done that. That is in place. Matt is going to have a, an orientation and retreat for his executive board here in the next two weeks. And that's to kind of get them set in and in lockstep with the initiatives that he wants to move forward. We had a wonderful, the last weekend in July, we had a wonderful beef show more than over 450 cattle being shown by young people in the state of Florida. We utilize the state fairgrounds uh, facility, and it and, and not all those people are commercial producers, but they they are uh, raising kids right and giving them an opportunity in their hobby. And they're not playing soccer or every weekend. They're showing cattle and learning responsibility and teaching them husbandry techniques and teaching them showmanship. So we have an outstanding set of youth leaders. Uh, at our annual convention, we had over 200 participants. We had like, I don't know the number, was it uh, 39 public speakers right. that participated in public speaking competition down there. But it's, it's we're not trying to replace 4-H, we're not trying to replace FFA, we're, we're trying to complement those programs and supplement those programs with, with young people out of the livestock industry. Just last week, we hosted our Florida Beef Council Board and our Florida Cattlemen's Association Board in conjunction. We had some of the dairy industry there with us. We had Florida Farm Bureau there with us. We had the Division of Animal Industry there with us in an issues management workshop. And what we were trying to do is get everybody on the same uh, page if we were to ha uh, have an outbreak of a disease, an occurrence of uh, uh, another occurrence of a uh, screw worm flies being discovered on the state, or if we were, if there was a food safety issue, or if there was some sort of, uh, of of potential negative story coming forward, we want to be able to manage it and help the public understand the real story and get the facts out. So we wanted to equip equip people with a, a good basic outline of how how to make sure we can proactively manage that. We had IFAS folks there as well um, because we count on. In every county, in 67 counties, there's a team of people that, that 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 operate out of extension offices, and they can they can get to the public with factual information. It's just an example of how we try to equip our volunteer leaders to help us manage through issues that that might be harmful to our to our to our industry, based pure on public perception and something catching on fire, if you will on the internet or, or, you know, through social media, and it being totally mis misunderstood and misinterpreted. Of course, we've got a heifer sale that they, I think this will be the 17th or 18th annual heifer sale that the association puts on. It's not, it's not designed to be a moneymaker for the association. It's not designed to replace many of the great private 
uh, heifer sales that are being around. It's an opportunity for folks that are raising good quality replacement cattle to expose their cattle to people that have an interest in them. In most cases, people will put a sampling of what they're raising and the heifers they're going to have to be sold in that sale. And we, we put that out there for people to see, and it helps network through our industry. Of course, uh, we, we manage a lot of entities, uh, but leadership development in our organization, we have a program called the Florida Cattlemen's Leadership Academy that we put together back uh, several years ago. I think we we're about to, to we were starting our fifth, sixth yeah. class it, it, later in the month of August, and it's designed to bring along and bring some younger producers into uh, understanding of, of uh, lobbying, uh, governance, of being engaged and involved in our organization so that so that we will have a, a I, I would say a fresh crop or a, a minor league that will advance up through our organization to keep the organization strong and we bring all elements to it to help them understand how to get involved and engaged in and impact uh, policies and things that will be of concern to you wherever you are and however you're involved in the association. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our outstanding allied members. We have a, a, a 300, some 300 strong folks that, that are suppliers of goods and services to, to our industry, from bankers to tractor people to fertilizer people to, to pharmaceutical people. If they supply a good or service of some kind, we invite them to come be engaged. If we're going to have a strong industry for them to sell into, uh, they need us to survive and exist. We certainly need them to bring science and those goods and services to our organization. Um, we operate around quarterly meetings. Matt's first quarterly meeting that he will conduct as the, as the president will occur in September. It's gonna be in Plant City, uh, September 12 and 13. And then we'll have a meeting in December in his home county of Okeechobee in, in early December. And then we'll have our big legislative session legislative quarterly, and it will be early this year because the session on the even numbered years is in January and February. And so in 2020, we will have uh, in, in the week of the 21st of, of uh, January, we will have our quarterly meeting in Tallahassee where we are have hats in the Capitol, boots on the ground. We feed a lot of beef on the street, but we're trying to help those elected officials understand that we exist and the decisions they make affect everything and everybody in the land management and the cattle business, whether you're a researcher or a cattle owner or an employee, but we try to take to them our priorities and areas of focus. Sam Ard works for us in Tallahassee as our government affairs person. He's been up there 20 years. He's part of the Ag Coalition, which is a coalition of all ag commodity groups. And we work again collectively to try to, to protect ag and to advance agriculture. And it's a huge part of the economic engine in the state of Florida, and we try to keep it thriving and viable. Some other entities I wanna mention real quick, something that we've been successful with lobbying for is the beef, is the Cattle Enhancement Board. The Cattle Enhancement Board is a separate board, but we certainly have, have had the opportunity to place some producers on that board from within our association. There's also some, produce, some folks on there from, from IFAS, and there's some from the Department of, of Ag. It is a direct service organization of the University of Florida. We have been able to secure some funding to fund, and this will be, I believe, our fifth year, some funds. It's a pool of funds that, that many of you all, especially you researchers and, and support team of researchers, have put forth. And as we speak, we're, th those proposals or funding for some of those research projects are coming together and they will go before that cattle enhancement board for them to make some decisions on which particular research they feel is vital to advance the industry, to strengthen the, the beef cattle industry in the state of Florida and, and move it forward. But, but I'm real proud of that board. It's been an injection of, of funds that didn't exist uh, five years ago and it's allowed our researchers a tool to really do some fine work. The thing about research, you can't just snap your finger and solve something overnight. It has to be repetitive. The problems or the smut grass or, or the soils issues or the supplemental issues or mineral, whatever you're trying to discover and figure out, figure it out, this is a long-term big picture deal. 
and and then this research funding is i'm real proud that we've been able to sustain it and that some of the, the fine work that we've done and we've tried to showcase that work when the reports are final through our communication tool which is our florida cattleman and livestock journal monthly magazine that barbara does a wonderful job with but it is the communication piece back to our industry and our, our people like it and utilize it a great deal Maybe you tell them about the foundation. All right. Um, I've, the, the, as a cattlemen association, we have a foundation, uh, which which is our philanthropic arm. I mean, yeah. I, I guess you want to say so. C3. Yes, five hundred one C three. So, um, you know, if somebody wants to invest in our future or or in our way of life, that that's a uh, an avenue to do that. So, one one of the major fundraisers on that is the Ranch Rodeo Finals, which are September the 27th. 28th in Kissimmee. So that's the ranch rodeos around the state. They qualify a team, go there. It's a heritage festival. It's a big, big event. Um, you know, we, we want our folks to be there, but we want some outside folks to be there to see the heritage and, and, and the ranch rodeo in our way of life. So the, some of the things that they fund would be the UF uh, judging teams. Um, they, they help with our uh, Florida uh, Leadership Academy that Jim spoke about um oh history. yeah our history so the article in the magazine that bob stone writes uh, that that's funded by the foundation our leadership development there there is some research that we're funding through that and uh some scholarships um, i mean typical um the junior programs like jim jim mentioned about the foundation helps with with that at the state finals that, that were the other day um so, and, and the cattle enhancement board is, is a big deal, like you mentioned too, but the, the foundation is, is, has been very successful. Um, if you have somebody that's looking for a place to invest some of their funds for, for a, a tax benefit, um, that, that would be one of the places that we would encourage you to, uh, to, to get with us and see. Absolutely, um, and there, there have been several gifts that have come to the Florida Cattlemen's Foundation to support this very, uh, uh, facility here, the range cattle experiment station. In fact, um, uh, we've, we've actually funded facilities and research at ONA, facilities in, uh, at, the, at the beef teaching unit in Gainesville, and facilities at, I would call the sister research station at the North Florida Research and Education Center. Over time, funds have flown, flown through the uh, foundation to help undergird basically the things we need for the industry this very building some gifts came to support this building from our industry through our foundation uh, and that's there we mention it because it does some real important vital work it is a 501c3 it cannot be utilized in any any manner to affect government policy but it can be utilized for the purposes for which it was get recognized and granted 501c3 status by um by the by the irs and that is a separate board and one unique thing about that board is is we've, we've got not all cattle people on that board we've got several attorneys several cpas some people out of other a judge people out of other professions with outstanding judgment outstanding business ability and it also broadens our reach because they're interacting with the not just cow people across the fence but it broadens our reach to another set of people it's done some great work. It meets uh, three to four times a year, and we sh we fund from the Sheriff Boys Ranch to the Livestock Judging Team to the Champions of Champions program at the State Fair to a museum exhibit to to all kind of a, a whole wide variety of things through the foundation. Yeah, and and to kind of wrap up where where we've been going with this whole deal, um, we we've got some digographics that we've used. Uh, through legislature, through um, just on, on social media to where where we challenged the University of Florida to come through and, and do a... Yeah, we commissioned a, this study. Yeah, through, through with the University the, of Florida. The economists at the University of Florida, and they completed this study to give us some, some, some current economics about the impact of the footprint of the industry in the state of Florida. And that's become very useful because uh, it's updated information about the number of people we employ, the, the impact on the economy, and the environmental services we provide. And it really illustrates, uh, again, our impact 
um, and, and we've used it a lot with elected officials for a quick study, help them learn more about our, our, our world in rapid fashion, but it is, it is based on fact and economic analysis, Chris. Yep, and, and to kind of finish up kind of what, what we uh, started in the beginning about sharing our heritage, that's, that's my hashtag. Alex Johns did a good job of, of kind of setting the stage and, and you know, let, let's put our stuff out there that people don't see. How are she going to educate him? You know, so so he had to uh, uh, show your passion, and then uh, I, I spent a year thinking about what what to do. And I go back to my great grandfather and the founding of the Florida Cattlemen Association, and, and and my heritage, and and just like I said at the convention, whether you're a first generation and you've just bought a ranch, or you're leasing a place, or you're showing a steer, you're you're you still have a heritage because you have that going forward. And then there's a lot of heritage uh at, from my family to the, our staffs and 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 our our other leadership that that when we interact with these water management folks or these legislators there's one thing about it that that uh people are more um caring for cattle people or or the cowboy way of life you know i, I guess that's the way you'd see it. and uh and i've seen that in in the years that i've had dealt in public service so so my challenge is to hashtag your uh, share your heritage, wh whether you're on social media or you have a family member that is, you know, sh when you're shipping calves, take some pictures of the semis backed up to the shoots, take pictures of, of the sunrise in the morning. I mean, one of the cool things that we got to do um, a couple of weeks ago was I had a photographer come with me, a uh, guy out of Bass out of, out of Lake Wales, and, and he's, he just came out of the blue and said, hey, I want to come with you one day and see what you do capture some images so i'm like well if you can be there at six o'clock you know you can ride off with us if you don't get in the way shoot yeah so uh so he showed up and he captured some images and and i'll i'll tell you this i'm pretty active on social media and then i've got some folks that tell me i'm i'm better than what i think i am but so when people um acknowledge what i've done when i can go to ncba in denver and some of the folks from texas say hey we see the pictures that y'all are posting on Instagram and Facebook and, and they're seeing it and, and they're, you know, it's, it's, it's getting bigger than just Florida. But anyway, Adam captured some images that, that I go back to the wildlife we take for granted. And, and I mean, my forefathers, just like a lot of y'all didn't ride around with a camera Austin cause he didn't have one number one. And number two, they were, they were worried about getting the job done. Well, our job is to get the job done but then we have to tell the next generation or, or the people that don't know what we do, what we do, man. You know, I mean, that, that's part of it. And, and there's some folks that have really captured this and, and they've, they've done good, but, but he, I told him what I wanted to do was I wanted to capture the heritage and what we were doing. And he didn't get in the way and he was capturing some images about our brands and about what we do. And, you know, that day I had my crew with my two, two of my children. Um, so, so they captured those images and then you get folks from outside of our area saying, Hey, this is pretty neat. We want to follow you. We, we want to see what you're doing. You know, I've been able to interact with folks that weren't necessarily meat eaters, but now they may be. Um, so, so I challenge you to, to, to share your heritage and, and what you do, uh, whether it's here at the university. I mean, this is a pretty neat facility on, on the way you handle cattle and, and you ship cattle or, or whether it's, you know, at home, five or six generations, everybody's got a pretty neat story. And once you share it, you'll find out the folks that really uh, appreciate it and, and they'll kind of warm up to you. So that's kind of what I've got for today. I just want to acknowledge, I'm looking at everybody here, but I want to uh, recognize Dr. Hodges. He was one of the early team members of this outfit and he, it was 107. He just celebrated his 107th birthday and he's a fine resident of Hardy County. Oh. In concluding, I, I would ask you all to get involved in our organization. Um, uh, if you're not a member, we would love for you to consider joining. You don't have to be a member to receive email and e-newses from us. If you'll go to uh, floridacattlemen.org and log in, you'll get periodic emails about a variety of things, some things that are done through IFAS and, and things like that, but they may, you know, it may be something we're trying to bring to the attention of the industry on some public policy or, or uh, just, just general information about a deadline or some news about the industry. 
please go to our website, floridacattlemen.org, and sign up to receive that. If there's anything our organization can do or there's things that you all would like to see us focus upon, uh, reach out to myself, our staff, or any of our officers and communicate with them. We have a really neat story. We're going to be celebrating 500 years of cattle in Florida. Uh, other places want to claim it, but we own it. And, uh, and they've been here, and we hope they will continue to be here. Our cow herd is, uh, is safe and secure. Our total cow herd, the, the, the statistic service indicates 1.6 million head of beef cattle here, and uh, that has not changed much in the last 20 years. And that's a tribute to you folks that do wonderful work and research, developing the science, and our producers that implement that science and do a good job holding it together. I think there's some time for a few questions. We might have to invite a driver in or somebody to answer them, but um, <laughs> I guess we can fire away. Okay, we've got a, a little bit of time for a few questions. I'd also just like to share two announcements with you real quick. Um, the first announcement being that uh, our next ONA highlight will be September the 10th. Um, Juliana Ranches will um, be discussing the differences in selenium and copper uh, metabolism between Brahmin and Angus cattle. So that's going to be our, our next ONA highlight for September. And then the other announcement was if you haven't made plans already, um, please make plans to attend uh, our Range Cattle Research and Education Center Field Day um, and Forage Release. Um, and that's going to be on October 24th, uh, 2019 from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, so those are our two announcements. We'll see if we have some, um, some questions online and as well as if we have any questions in the room, we'd be glad to uh, take those as well. Hold on just one second. Yeah, so the, go ahead. the question was about uh, an animal ID update for uh, for those of us that are online. Just an update on on where the Florida Cattlemen's Association stands on on uh, animal ID in Florida. Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, or if I get out of line, because um, there's a lot more guys that are more heavily involved than I am. But um, so we. We, we do we are advocating the traceability and and trying to encourage our members to uh implement an animal id program eid program and and i would encourage our mem encourage our members to go on and look at the timeline because right now you know for an animal to enter or commerce she has to have the the metal tag um the, the bright tag so that's going to go away and, and i don't know the timeline right off the top of my head but i think those tags are going to go away at they're gonna they're gonna stop being free at the end of 2019, right? Or 2020. Okay, and then you'll be able to purchase them during 2021, and then the December 31st of 2021, animal ID will be mandatory. I think that's the. the, the, the I don't have that in front of me. So yeah, the timeline. So I'd encourage you to look at the timeline, but. But the point of that is that the metal tags are kind of going to go away um, and we're going to implement EID. So with, with that being said, we're encouraging our producers to, to implement an EID program when cattle enter commerce. And then we've just won a grant. From the USDA, uh, we won a grant that will help us advance our pilot project. We are working with two livestock markets in the state. We hope to, hope to be working with a packer. And we're just trying to educate the industry on how EID works and what what it might uh, what all, all might entail from the standpoint of tracking for animal disease and managing against animal disease. Certainly, some people use some of the data to manage their operations, inventory control. But the, the first element will be for animal disease and, and to, you know to to track where animals are coming on and. Right now, the law's not changed. It's uh, it's mature cattle um, that aren't going to slaughter that are in commerce that would have to be taxed. But there are pilot projects around the country. Three, two big ones that I'm familiar with is one in Kansas, uh, driven by uh, Kansas Livestock Association, and it's involving all sectors of the industry. Um, and then one in Texas, 
that uh, is, a, is one effort by the Texas Cattle Feeder and a, a big set of industry folks out there in Texas and Southwest cattle raising. And they're collaborating with some other states. I anticipate we're going to be tagging some Florida cattle going to those, some of those participating feed yards, again, just to track them and track movement and to get familiar with how it, how it all works. Uh, right now, there's, uh, there's this tagging going on, and cattle going through the sale barn at the Arcadia stockyard, and soon to be with some going through the Ocala stockyard. It's not all figured out, but the USDA has said we are moving in that direction most definitely. Industry tell us what you want it to look like, so we're trying to make sure we're engaged and be, be part of the solution and understand it to make it as it's going to be a, a, certainly a bit of an undertaking. It's certainly going to be a bit painful. It's certainly going to change the way uh, we do business to a, to a, to a degree. Um, um, but if, if, if it's going to come to, to fruition, we need it to work at the speed of commerce and it needs to be developed, we think, by a producer. Uh, with, with certainly oversight by the government officials and that's the state. Division of Animal Industry, in our case, our state veteran, he works through the Department of Ag. And then at the federal level, certainly APHIS uh, through, through the USDA inspection service. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Have you, uh, the Cattlemen Association, uh, identified you know, the four management district boards around the state? There's so many vacancies right now. Have you identified anybody that's able to come around the state? We have. We've offered some names. Um, it, it's not an easy, th those are quite busy uh, volunteer positions that are appointed. Um, I mean, it's strenuous. They meet a lot and there's some major decisions and you're opening yourself up to quite a bit of, of, of public criticism. Um, so there's not somebody standing and, 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 and farmers and ranchers are pretty busy and there's not somebody standing on every corner holding their hand up saying, I'll take it. But we have found people and uncovered people that certainly have the, the wherewithal and ability. Uh, in recent times, we haven't won any of those appointments uh, um, of late. But we're, we're, still, we're still going we're to still, state. We're still mining talent yeah. and trying to come up with people that are willing to serve, that understand our industry, because we want ag at the table, if at all possible. But if we don't have ag at the table, we're inviting them to come to the farm yeah. and educate them and build a, a dialogue to where they feel comfortable, they trust us and we can bring them to the scientist and and and, and show, show them what we're doing and educate them to overcome some of the misunderstandings. But that's a good point, we so, hope. Yeah, just to expound on that a little bit, Matt, it, it's not just the water management districts too. I mean, that's one of the things that our association gets to facilitate. So if it's uh, Lisa Pretty on the Bear Task Force, isn't that yeah, what it was? Yeah. Um, so, so if it's FWC or or if it's water management, I mean, we've got somebody plugged in on the agencies. You know, whether it's the um, you know search committee for the new uh, chair of IFAS. That's right. You, you know, I mean, we're our association is plugged in, and and we've got our qualified people at at the table to, to all those. That, that's a good question, but I mean, that's that's part of our challenge is to keep, like Jim said, mining talent and putting people in those positions. Absolutely. We'd like to first thank our, our two presenters here today and, and thank everyone in attendance and online uh, for joining us for this ONA highlight. And, and uh, we'll conclude it at that. And, and hopefully we'll see uh, everyone again next month. So thank you again. And uh, we'll see you soon.